I'm Hashem Kutsi, co-founder of Liwa Capital Advisors. My partner Khalifa Al-Kindi and I set up Liwa in 2017 to share our insight and offer a solution to savers drawn from our long experience in managing capital for sovereign wealth funds. Geographic diversification and economic balance are the main disciplines of our approach. Having been allocating capital since the early 90s, we saw the benefits and reliability of such an approach practiced by Bridgewater Associates. Joining me today is Bob Prince, co-CIO at Bridgewater Associates for a discussion on how to manage savings in the world of zero interest rates and printing of money. Bob and I have interacted and experienced different market environments over the past 30 plus years and now living in a new world in our career. Hope you would enjoy that discussion. I wanted to share with you this discussion today that I'm going to have with Bob because I think it really sort of uh, prepares us perhaps for a new, a new environment. And this in a way touches a, a, the, the savings of a nation or an individual. Uh, we have always seen throughout our experience that uh, being prepared for an environment is better than just being caught off guard. So, Bob, thank you for uh, taking uh, time today. Thank you, uh, Hashem. It's good to see you. Same here. Uh, I think probably, you know, if we can just go back like maybe 30 years of what we've experienced to what got us here, because, you know, quite often we all take, you know, the trends that we've experienced as the norm not really digging into what has what was behind them. And uh, as we sort of uh, uh, spoke so many times and, and, and look at what's been happening, the trends are definitely uh, difficult to continue. And I, I just wanted you know, to set that, that scene of what has transpired up to now to really look then ahead and uh, share with people what are the challenges that could be ahead of us. Especially, you know, this is really uh, the savings that we all, you know, want to ensure uh, that are able to sustain us to, to continue enjoying life, so to speak. Right, right. Um, yeah, well, as you said, Hashem, you know, going back it, about 30 years now, right? It's uh, back, we go back to the early 90s. And if, and if you think about the world since the early 90s, you've had uh, a combination of some very big secular trends occurring and also a whole number of particular instances of, of crisis or difficulty or booms or busts. And so the, the booms and the busts and the crises are occurring within the context of that bigger move, some of those bigger moves that have happened. But yeah, since the early 90s, uh, you had long-term capital, right? 98, you had um, the dot-com, uh, boom and bust. You had uh, Y2K, right? That was a crisis that came and went and was never actually a crisis. <laughs> All the computers are going to shut down, um, right? And then you had obviously the financial crisis. Uh, we've had a pandemic, uh, you know, so uh, a lot of different events along the way. Uh, you, you really it could go on and on and on. But at the same time, uh, there's been kind of that, that river you know, of, of continual shift uh, over time. And, you know, back in the early 90s, you know, we're talking about bond yields in the kind of mid, you know, five, six, seven, eight, four to eight, right? And I, I remember I was thinking about this the other day that how uh, uh, in the early 90s, when uh, Greenspan said uh, monetary policy feels like, it feels like you're running monetary policy into a 50 mile an hour headwind. Remember that? And that was really the first time that we started to get the effects of what we refer to as over indebtedness in a long term debt cycle down wave, pressuring down on markets and making it difficult to stimulate economies. And I remember uh, at that time, the when the real T bill rate hit zero, and, and it was I think inflation was three and the nominal rate hit three and the real T bill rate hit zero and it's like oh my gosh could you believe a zero real interest rate? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we're, we're now uh, you know ten years into negative real interest rates and counting right. So uh, those big shifts have been occurring and at the same time then you know that was actually before the emergence of China right. I mean it had just begun but. Then you had entrance into WTO, and and so let's say since the early 2000s, 
we've had a, we're in the middle of a complete shift in the global balance of economic power where China was, uh, you know, a, definitely a third world country. And, and now China and Asia are surpassing the US and Europe in terms of their impact on world economies and, and you know, gradually world affairs. So really, really big shifts over that period. And at the same time, you know, lots of, lots of interesting activity along the way. Yeah, the, 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 you know, uh, 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 whether it's, you know, organizations or whether sort of for, for people savings, the idea is that you need to preserve the purchasing power of the, of the savings and grow it. So from my old, you know, sort of uh, uh, early career, the OECD inflation plus 3% that used to be, you know, the bogey for the organization. Or even I think you know people people recognize see, seeing that they are they, they see their their ability to, to, to spend growing, uh, and I think you know the the uh, uh, as as you correctly said you know the, the the cut in interest rates have really helped helped asset classes rally so that that objective was achieved with the drop in inflation. So to the extent you know you've you've had sort of uh, large pools of capital or even you know the individual investors generating a return ranging between six to eight percent somewhere in that vicinity uh, and at that time you know even if you placed money in 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 in, in, in deposits you were earning something although sometimes it would catch up with inflation and sometimes it is below now the world we're in today obviously is a is a zero interest rate and uh, and markets have rallied you quite a bit and we know of course there is there is a lot of debt so from that from that angle now what do you think is the are the challenges to pools of savings mm -hmm. in yeah. terms of one is you know the the, the 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 preserving of purchasing power and of course to being able to provide that annual uh, expenditure, whether it is to the nation or, 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 or to a retiree, so to speak. Yeah, the, uh, that's the big issue right now uh, because uh, we're in the middle of a massive wealth shift and, and global rebalancing between debtors and asset holders. And because of the accumulation of debts um, and so forth, the, um, you know, the incentives have shifted for policymakers to really relieve the debt burdens at the cost of the asset holders. And so in order to sustain tolerable economic conditions and particularly with, with uh, wealth inequality, the, um, you know, we now have a negative real interest rate. We're in a world of wealth destruction. And uh, that wealth destruction is right now, it's occurring very gradually uh, through negative real interest rates. If you'd held T-bills in the last 10 years, you're already down 15% in your real purchasing power. In another 10 years, it's probably going to be another 20%. So you're talking about 35% reduction in, in purchasing power from holding a T-bill, and now that's priced into bonds. You go back to the 30s and the early 1900s, uh, you had 50 and 80% declines in the real purchasing power from holding cash, right? That's an entirely different world than when you originally bought inflation index bonds, uh, you know, going back into the mid-90s. Um, you were uh, very active in inflation index bonds and real yields were, I think, four and a half percent on a treasury bond, right? <laughs> and so we go from four and a half percent to negative 50 basis points. That, it, looking backwards, that had a very beneficial effect on asset prices. And um, in fact, I think you had, you had leveraged inflation index bonds, so that would be even better. <laughs> but um, but now, uh, the ex that looking backwards, that raised asset returns. But looking forward, that that locks in wealth destruction to hold that that kind of an asset right now. And so, in the short term, and so we, I, it, it's been a long time since we've had to actually think about real returns. It, it 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 because asset prices have done so well. But going forward, the pricing is increasingly priced to have very poor real returns. Uh, and so that raises new questions, I think. It, they shouldn't be new, but they're more, they're just brought to the surface. Um, and I think the, the question, the first question to ask is, uh, what is my risk neutral position? In other words, it, 
through all of our history of managing money and um, in any sort of uh, risk management plans that we used to do for companies. And the first question is always, what is your risk neutral position? In other words, if I didn't have a view of anything, what should I hold? And, and, and today, if you held cash, people think of cash as a, as a low risk asset. Cash is a very risky thing to hold right now. You don't see it in the price volatility, but you'll see it in the, in the accumulation effects. So what is my risk neutral position? And um, you know, this is uh, some great work that, that Ray did uh, over the past year of going back over the last 200 years and looking at every asset class and uh, what was the maximum drawdown in real wealth from holding every asset class in every country. And ev every asset class in every country over the last 100, 200 years it has, a period, has had a period within the span of a decade of a 50 to 80% decline in real purchasing power. Every single asset class in every single country. And um, that's the world that we're in. In the short term, the policies that are producing that environment are actually driving money from cash into assets. So the, the short term uh, effects of that feel good that devaluing cash in negative real, real terms is driving money from cash into assets, which is driving asset prices up, but that's driving their yields down. And that, as that drives their yields down, that drives their expected returns down. And so you're gradually pricing it across the entire risk curve, this very low or negative real return environment. And that, you know, like I say, in the short term, that feels good, but you have to play out what that means later. And as those yields get lower and lower and lower, and how are you doing that? You're doing it by devaluing money, right? And as you devalue money, uh, do people continue to hold that money? When you look at dollars today, uh, 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 you know, the dollar is down uh, since the beginning of the, this phase of monetization, dollars down 12% against the Euro. It's down 8% against the RMB. It's down 6% against the yen. Uh, the treasury bond yield is 50, has gone from 50 to 100 basis points. So if I'm an international investor, as your, as your clients are, uh, but also think about sovereign wealth funds and where they're distributed in the globe and what their risk neutral position is. Their risk neutral position is not the whole dollars uh, because those, those sovereign wealth funds are by and large in Asia. You go down the Asia coast, you got China, Hong Kong, Korea, Singapore, Australia. Those are the huge sovereign wealth funds uh, only in Canada do we really have that in North America, not in the United States. So, so as a sovereign wealth fund, if you're looking at dollar assets and you're getting 50, 100 basis points on uh, yield on your bonds and you have the, and the printing of money and the fiscal deficits are expanding, what's my incentive to hold those bonds versus have the currency risk? The currency risk is a risk to those investors. For a U.S. pension fund, it's a little bit different because their liability is in dollars. And so you'd have to actually see that flow through to the inflation rate. But, but as you play through uh, the, the, the current environment and how the current environment transitions to the future environment, the current environment feels good uh, for money to move from cash to assets, particularly out of dollars into other, other assets. But over time, as those yields come down as a result of that, um, and the dollar becomes increasingly vulnerable. So, so that's the, that, that is the, the biggest thing that we think that people need to be thinking about now, we need to be thinking about real returns and need to be thinking about what, is, what currency do you hold, not just what assets you hold. Uh, but wouldn't you say, I mean, if you want to follow through this also argument, so an endowment that's supposed to produce 5%, for uh, to the university, a sovereign wealth fund that suppose you know to fund requirements for the country, a saver who has put in his mind that you know I'm going to receive that much income for me to to, to to retire. All of this now, if returns end up being lower than what people have gotten used to, that's going to mean that people have less to spend or their savings starts starts shrinking, which of course has others other order of effects 
So how do you see this playing out or, or does this require a long period of time for it to really kick in? Uh, it, well, the, the, uh, the, the COVID, the pandemic has brought it forward. I mean, it, it's something that's been unfolding and it was out there. Uh, this environment was out there, but it was unfolding gradually. Uh, like, like as we you know, started our discussion, it's really been unfolding since the 90s in a certain respect, and even before that, right? So that, um, but the pandemic has accelerated the process because what the pandemic has done is there are really two big forces that have accelerated that. One is that how was the actual virus managed? And so in Asia, the virus was managed technologically or administratively or whatever. They just, you know, they didn't let it get out of hand. Um, in the West, it was managed by, uh, you know, showering people with money, uh, you know, printed money and showering them with money and covering the lost income with that money printing. And so, and so that has both widened the economic gap between East and West, or let's say accelerated the trends that already existed between the outperformance of Asia and the relative to the West. Uh, so the economic gap is in accelerated. Um, and, but it's also made, made a stepwise shift in the relative balance sheets of the two areas, right? So the saving countries are still big savers. The debtor countries, the dollars and euros are bigger debtors than ever before. And so that has made a step change in, in the financial, um, you know, financial strength uh, and just the amount of dollars in circulation versus other currencies in circulation. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a gradual thing, but it's, it's increasingly near. It's, I wouldn't say it's way out there, no. So in a way you think, you know, that this reality is gonna set in and, and, and people sort of, actual returns versus what they've experienced in the past is there's going to be a big gap. Well, the currency thing is probably first. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, the relative global performance is imminent. Uh, for, and for example, uh, another thing to take into account is the pricing that um, because of the, uh, the printing of money in dollars and euros, and the, uh, the driving of the interest rates into to nominal rates close to zero and, and negative real interest rates um, and the production of that liquidity driving asset prices up while not doing that in Asia, that if I compare, let's say the US to China, the China is very high likely to outgrow the United States over the 10 years. Uh, productivity growth is probably gonna be higher. But uh, when you look at the forward pricing in the markets, the RMB is now discounted to fall by 30% against the dollar over the 10 years because the interest rate differential has been widened by pushing the U.S. interest rate down through that production of liquidity. The production of liquidity drives the U.S. interest rate down the, uh, because of how the virus is handled. And in China, it stays the same. So now you have, you have a spot exchange rate of six and a half. It was seven not too long ago. And you have a forward exchange rate that's 30% lower in, in, in the RMB versus the dollar. Uh, if you look at the forward pricing of, the, of earnings growth, that you also have slower earnings growth discounted in China than the United States. So, so you have the, a forward pricing uh, of, dollars, of dollar assets against uh, RMB China assets that's discounting substantial underperformance and declines in relative prices over 10 years at the same time that the secular trends are in the opposite direction. So, so that's not, that was not the case nearly to the same extent before the pandemic. So, that, uh, so the pandemic has both accelerated the, the real differences that are occurring and the balance sheets and shifted the, shifted the pricing to point in the opposite direction. So from a current valuation standpoint, we see that as attractive right now, right? Unhedged assets in China versus dollars is attractive right now because of that pricing and those trends. And then whether you get an accelerated move or not, it's like, well, do you really care that much, right? And so you, you, it, it, probably at some point, but, but China is also managing their situation to, to be fairly gradual. So, 
Um, so that's the international situation, which I think is particularly relevant to your investors. If I look at just the U.S. domestic situation, it's a little different because, um, you know, uh, they have a dollar denominated debts and but they might have a real return objective, but it's in dollars. And so uh, it's going to take longer for that the, the this process to really you know, and be uh, detrimental to a domestic inter- institutional investor because the currency depreciation is not a big deal because you're matched on both sides, assets and liabilities. In fact, the, the rise of a foreign currency against the dollar is a big gain for you. And um, that it probably takes a while for this to actually manifest in any significant inflation rates. So you're really just faced with the drag of of the of the of the of the very low real yield on the assets, uh, which works its way out over time, has its impacts over time, but it's not as uh, potentially imminent as the, the this set of environment would be for international investors. That, so that, I'll add one more thing to that, which is that, however, if the currency is sub- uh, significantly out of hand, if there's a pop in growth. If there's a, 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 an uptick in inflation of a notable amount, and if the currency comes under pressure, and that would be the first thing that would happen, you start to see bond yields rise in the United States. And at the same time, you've got the big fiscal deficits. So at that point, is the Fed going to buy the bonds or not? Right? Faced with strong growth, pick up inflation, rising bond yields, and the dollar falling. Uh, will, the Fed, will the Fed buy the bonds? Will the Fed tighten? The Fed will probably still buy the bonds to keep the economy going to some, at some, uh, to some extent. But there's a risk that when they stop doing that, and then if they have to raise interest rates, the big risk for the U.S. investor is that the yields on assets fall. And then if international conditions get out of hand, the Fed has to raise rates after those yields have fallen. And then you have a pretty serious decline in U.S. assets, even in, in local currency terms. That, that's just a scenario. It'll probably be wrong. <laughs> you know, he who forecasts is destined to eat ground, ground glass. You know, you've heard us say that for 30 years. And so really the right way to play it is what is the next shoe to drop? Just position for the next shoe to drop. Uh, because, you know, we've always described it as what is the optimal response to known conditions, not the, not the response to your forecast. So, but, but, but I think what you're, what, you're, what you're asking is a good question, which is, you know, what are the scenarios, what are the possibilities and how do we, how do we imagine the sort of things that could happen? And then how do we structure a portfolio today so that it's either struck, either neutralized to that or it's adaptable to that world, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, because I think, you know, the, I mean, We've all sort of lived to to see that no country continues doing the best. And uh, and you do have decades whereby, you know, the best could be the worst and vice versa. Uh, So the geographic diversification is is always something that we've all lived through and, uh, and embraced. And perhaps, you know, the word you're describing now is even more important. I think, you know, it was shocking that last year, China, U.S. performance versus the U.K. Three sort of, you know, three yeah. economies that are uh, uh, developed in a way who have a, such a stark uh, performance. Yeah, and uh, if you look at that, it's already interrupt, but when you look at that, they're still 80% correlated along the way, mm-hmm. right? Yes. If you look at the correlation of the weekly or the monthly returns, they're 80% correlated even though the UK is down 20%, the US is up 20, even though there's a 40, 50% cumulative difference in the returns, the correlations are high along the way because the wiggles are correlated, but you get accumulated differences. And, and you, just, you just said um, an important thing, which is that as you look at decade by decade performance, uh, the best in one decade could be the worst in the next decade. And yet what you would see is that they'd all be correlated along the way. And so people look at the correlation and they, they think that there's not very much uh, benefit to geographic diversification because they say, oh, these are correlated. But you need to look at the dispersion of returns, right? The dispersion of the ultimate returns. In other words, 
over the course of a year or, or five years or, or a decade, what is the range between the high and the low? And you don't want to be stuck with the low, right? And so you're much more, you're much more happier, much happier going for the middle. Um, and, and geographic diversification has actually uh, historically provided a lot of benefit when you look at returns in that way. Uh, in terms of, let's say, the dispersion of returns over the course of a decade, because the differences in returns are in the hundreds and two hundreds of percents between one country to the next, and then you add the currency in. And going forward, I think it's even more important, right? Uh, so yeah, that geographic diversification is much more important than people are recognizing, and definitely uh, much more important than as it's represented in people's portfolios. They just don't have nearly enough, uh, particularly between, I think of it between East and West. You got East and West. I mean, shouldn't a portfolio be roughly balanced between East and West, right? And, and it doesn't naturally happen because the market caps are a lot different in the two areas. But that's mostly because of the degree of securitization that's happened in the West and, and much less securitization of assets in the East. The sizes of the cash flows are comparable and, and yet the economies are moving differently. So, so thinking about the underlying cash flows that exist between those two parts of the world and diversifying between those cash flows and finding a way to do that and don't just stick to the market cap portfolio. Uh, Bob, I want to go back to you know uh, how your your point about how people should structure portfolios. Uh, I remember back you know coming out of the global financial crisis, you guys very much you know highlighted the risk of the low return ahead, and how people would be able to deal with them in either taking more risk, uh, taking a liquidity, or uh, adding leverage. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, moving forward, now, obviously, you know, moving forward now, uh, 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 the, uh, the return expectation have been even stretched more than uh, back then. W what is kind of, you know, your advice to investors in, in the route that they should take, knowing that also uh, the, uh, people are trying to do the same thing, like, you know, there is a rush to private equity. There is a rush to a private credit just because uh, they're thinking that there is alpha there, uh, not, the alpha not existent in the public markets. And the fact that when you have more time, you, could, you can stomach volatility better. Well, I, th I think the first thing is uh, throw market cap out the window cap and market pricing out the window as a way to determine what your asset mix should be. It's kind of silly when you think about it, right? Like imagine because the bond yield goes to zero and the price goes way up, I should hold more. Uh, Cause it, right. Cause this market cap goes up or if a, if a tech stock goes up by five times, I should hold more of it. <laughs> That's the basic theory of cap M. Um, I throw that out the window. So now what, what template do you use? And um, it's very important uh, of just balance is the most important uh, concept and, and balance can be achieved. Uh, you know, you can do, you can achieve balance without a computer and a statistical calculation. You could just think it through and, and achieve a balanced portfolio and the balance, but the balance should be between, uh, it should be on two dimensions. The balance should be on the dimension of, am I balanced to different uh, economic growth and inflation scenarios? Am I balanced to different economic scenarios in terms of how they're gonna affect the different assets that I hold? And am I balanced to different parts of the world? So there's environmental balance and there's geographic balance. That's the basic goal. And then there's an infinite number of ways to achieve that. Uh, the reason you mentioned leverage is because when you when you think about balance, the um, you want to balance how much risk you have in different assets, not just the amount of money you hold in different assets. And so, uh, if bonds are a good balance against stocks, but I hold a dollar of bonds and a dollar of stocks, I don't have balance because the stocks have are more variable than the bonds, and that's why the leveraging of the bonds. 
occurred is because you're just trying to get, or but you could deleverage the equities and have the same thing. You're just trying to get balance means a, a similar amount of risk between uh, you know different assets as well as between different geographies. So so um, so that's the basic principle is balancing environmental uh, environments and balancing geographies and adjusting the amount of assets that you hold in one versus another to, to achieve the, a balance in risk terms, not just in capital terms. Uh, the, uh, I, wanna, I, I wanna bring in that economic balance in the context of the, you've always had a good simple explanation of what any investment is uh, in terms of a future cash flow because that becomes a common denominator for private equity, real estate, yeah. public equity, bond, what have you. And so in the world of uh, zero rates, you guys have done a quite a bit of research on what could replace bonds. Yeah. And what caught my attention the other day, how you related also even private equity investments that have a stable cash flow. So could you just, you know, sort of uh, uh, bring in these, these, you know, th different asset classes together from that common denominator uh, 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 of, a, of a future cash flow to create that balance, especially in the, in the environment we're in today? Very important. Yeah, very important co uh, topic. Um, you know, we're all used to thinking about assets in terms of their return characteristics, uh, mean variance correlation. Um, but um, faced with a, a zero interest rate world, a zero bond yield, the, the performance characteristics of that bond yield are going to change, of that bond are going to change. And um, so if the yield is zero, the return is zero. And if the yield doesn't change, there's no price action. So all of a sudden, you know, it, the role of bonds in a portfolio can change. And that, that's what got us to thinking about what, what, what else might you go to, right? Imagine the 60-40 portfolio. Now the 40 is dead wood, zero return, and it's not providing diversification benefit to the 60. Plus the 60 of equities is actually more risky now because you can't have an interest rate cut to support it. So now what do you do, right? If you're a 60-40 investor. And um, the, way, the way we think about that kind of a problem is that we, uh, we break down the asset into its components. And any asset, uh, as you said, any asset is just a stream of cash flows and a discount rate on those cash flows to get the price. And so if you think about a bond, a bond is a very consistent stream of cash flows. It's a known stream of cash flows and a, and a discount rate that goes up and down. And, and so the price goes up and down just because of the discount rate going up and down, not because of the cash flows. And equity is a stream of cash flows that vary a lot and the discount rate varies a lot. So both things are happening at the same time and that's what's driving the price. So, if you were to build, could you build an equity portfolio that would have some of the characteristics of a bond? And in thinking that through, well, the first thing you want to do is see if you can create that steady stream of cash flows like a bond has, because that's their first key characteristic. So, so um, that you know, we we worked our way through that question, and we approached it in a very different way than than you would typically approach an equity investment. Typically, with an equity investment, you start looking at all the companies that are out there. You look at the sectors, and you look at the returns. Um, but that's a very unstable starting point. It's a sh that shifts. Companies buy and sell each other. They change their business models. You know, different sectors rise and fall, and so. Whereas what we're really trying to do is capture the macroeconomic connection that you normally have between macroeconomic conditions and a bond in terms of what kind of conditions, what kind of, uh, what, what, what kind of uh, performance characteristics it gives you. And so our starting point was to say, look, if I bought an equity, forget the equity security, if I just bought companies, if I look at, and I look at the, um, the economy first, and I look at different types of spending that occur in an economy. 
Can I find a stable sort form of spending in the economy? And then if I can find a stable form of spending in the economy, one person's spending is somebody else's income. So can I find the companies that are on the other side that, who receive that steady spending? And if they receive that steady spending, does it flow to the bottom line? And so by creating a collection of companies uh, that are purely designed to capture a sliver of that spending in the economy, no security selection, just buy them all. <laughs> all you want is the maximum market share of getting on the other side of that spending. And so it might be 400, it might be 600 companies at different times in history. You, it took that many companies to get that share, to get that, to get on the others, to capture the, a sliver of that spending. And when you do that across countries, whether it's Japan through the 90s or any country, the same thing would be true. And the reason is because certain types of spending are going to happen no matter what. And you think about there's a, the, uh, you know, go, go back to college and you learned about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? <laughs> Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, it, it starts with like food. It starts with like food and shelter, right? Then it goes to, you know, safety. Then it goes to love <laughs> and it ends up in self-actualization. Well, people have to, what we, when push comes to shove, you're going to go to the very bottom tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, <laughs> right? You will have food and shelter. You may not get love, but you'll get food and shelter. So, um, so what are the types of spending in an economy that represent that basic, those basic needs? And what you find is that yet is that that constitutes about one sixth of total personal consumption expenditures, that stuff. And, um, and it's been one six for the last 60 years. It's never changed. And, and it never goes down. Like there's, there's, I don't think there's ever been a year that you had a decline in that kind of spending, right? And so that's an anchor. That's a reliable source of cash flow that's occurring in the economic system. And now what all you need to do is use companies as a pass-through vehicle to capture that. And this is where you come to your point about public and private. Those could be private companies, they could be public companies because you're just trying to get a stable stream of cash flows. The next step is then you say, okay, now I've structured that. Remember the basic, you've got the cash flow and then you've got the discount rate, right? Okay, now we've dealt with the cash flow. Now what about the discount rate? Well, it's interesting that when, when you say, well, how's the world pricing these, this stable portfolio of companies? it's just as volatile as the stock market. <laughs> Even though the earnings are one fourth the volatility, the price is equal to equally volatile, which is a wild thing to think about. Like, gee, how, how does the market really, how do things really work? But, but it actually, that means it's actually more hedgeable because it's not representing future changes in cash flows. It's just representing future changes in market discounting, just like a bond. And so you can literally use the bond to hedge the discount rate, right? Or you can use other liquid assets to hedge changes in that discount rate. And through the, the, those two steps, you can dramatically lower the volatility of that equity portfolio uh, where your maximum losing period is you know, 10 or 15%, not 30 or 40%. And uh, in equity down markets, you're basically a, a zero return instead of negative 15. But in up markets, you know, a 15% up market, you're probably going to make 10. So it starts to take on some of the characteristics of a bond, even though it's equities, it starts to take on some of the characteristic of a bond in the terms of the, the reliability and the knowability of the returns, because the reliability and the knowability of the returns is ultimately linked to the cash flows. And the cash flows are not linked to companies or the stock market. The cash flows are linked to the to the very base of the economy and different forms of, of those forms of spending in the economy. So that's just one path that we've taken to try to engineer actually like a new asset class if to, to, that's really designed for this environment. Um, and, and actually two, 2020 was a great stress test because uh, you might think about your normal downturns, but last year was no normal downturn. You know, it was a pandemic and everybody just stayed home and stopped working. And actually, over the course of the year, those forms of spending were up 4% last year. 
just like normal. Whereas everything else was down 5%. It was the, I'm talking about in the United States where we have the best data. So even in a pandemic, they were down temporarily, but then they bounced back because they have to. And so uh, cumulatively over the course of the year, that's the level of spending rose 4% over the course of the year for those basic necessities that, 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 that are there. And then that flowed through to the revenues of the companies and that flowed through to the profitability of the companies. And they actually made more money, I think, because of the you know, money they got from the government. But anyway, that's the basic, that's the basic structure that, you know, and so these are the types of things that we're trying to do to basically adapt to this world. You got to, you got to play a lot more creativity than you had to do, you know, 20 years ago when, when bond yields are high and real interest rates were high. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's also, you know, fascinating, uh, fascinating time to be managing money. Actually, you know, thinking about it now, it's probably a new evolution in, in foreign institutions to look at their asset allocation, as in, you know, uh, aggregating the cash flows from real estate, from private equity, from private debt, and what have you, to be able to create to, to, to create a balance in the portfolio. I think 100% you know, agree. You know, somehow that discussion was discussed, but people were very much still looking at. I have a private equity allocation that much. I have a venture, I have a real estate. And so now the necessity is gonna force people to look at what every, invest, every investment or asset class is bringing to the overall asset allocation. Right, and the more stable that discount rate is, the more the cash flows matter anyway. So, so uh, we're working with some very large sovereign wealth funds right now on that specific question. How do, how do we rethink asset allocation and divide it between the, the, uh, what, the cash flow stream that my portfolio is earning and the price impact that, on those assets and actually uh, design an asset allocation that produces the most consistent cash flow stream, most consistent and, and steepest rising cash flow stream and sort of let the pricing takes care of itself or maybe hedge the pricing or, or whatever. So it, dividing those two things, I think is it like a, a degree of freedom that uh, uh, it is, it's the right way to do it really. Um, as it, and it's the right way to do it. And it's completely contrary to cap M. So and somehow, yeah, and somehow I think, you know, the, the, the environment is gonna force people to move into this line of thinking. I totally agree. Investors are going to have to be thinking about things differently uh, because if you think about a 60-40 portfolio and the 40% is in bonds and it's giving you a zero return, where do I go? Do I buy the, the equities that just went down 39% overnight on me? Do I want more of that? I don't think so. You're going to have to, and yet where else do you go? Because there's only really debt and equity, right? So if I go into, um, and so what can I buy? And now if I, but if I think about those assets in terms of the cash flows separate from the price, then I can think about the ultimate destination of my portfolio is gonna be driven by the cash flows. The price will vary along the way, but the destination is determined by the cash flows. It's like Warren Buffett said very well, he said in the long run, a market is a weighing machine, and in the short run, it's a voting machine. Uh, it, because in the long run, it's the accumulation of the cash flow that determines where the price is going to go. But in the short run, you get a lot of these uh, ups and downs along the way. So, uh, so I think for uh, to have a greater allocation to equities, which I think is is what is really your only choice if you don't have the bonds you're going to have to think about the cash flow pro, uh, generation of those equities, not just the price action. And I, I totally agree with you that there's no reason to separate it. When you're in that world of cash flow, a portfolio of cash flows, there's no reason to distinguish a publicly traded asset from a privately traded asset because they're all just generating cash flows. And it's sort of arbitrary, which whether, whether an asset is pu pu traded publicly or privately at any point in time anyway. Um, it's the same underlying business. So, so that's where we're headed, I think. And I think it's a whole different way 
on a much better way of thinking about portfolio structuring. And it's the farthest thing from cap M. So I guess, I mean, you know, from what you're describing, we're entering now this new, uh, new world where people have to look at their portfolios differently. And then there is these divergences between economies. And then, you know, there are certain instruments that are not available or one has to be able to either be short or long them at different times. This, you know, this kind of, you know, takes me back to the 90s when there were a lot of volatilities in so many different things to the extent, you know, the idea of just buying something and sleeping and then earning the return uh, was more about being able to trade around them or to, 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 to invest between the differences between countries and what have you. So is this now the environment we are entering? Uh, and if yes, you know, that definitely then differentiate investors in terms of what's what return they can achieve it's it'll be a different kind of volatility you're never going to get rid of volatility um and even even the lack of volatility sows the seeds for volatility because people leverage up um and and so but it'll be a different kind of volatility and you need to think and it'll be a different kinds of risk so you need to be thinking about risk, not just in the traditional terms of mean variance and correlation of returns. You need to be thinking about risk in terms of cash flows, how they relate to the economic environment, how they relate to policy. We have a di whole different kind of monetary policy now. Back in the, you know, back in the world you're talking about, it was a boom bust cycle uh, driven by changes in interest rates. Okay, it's gonna be hard to get a boom now because you can't cut interest rates. Um, you can't, you're not going to want to tighten because you can't cut them after that. So uh, it's an MP3 world, what we call an MP3 world, which is the merging of monetary policy with fiscal policy. And that means the government is directing the money. Where are they directing it? Are they directing it productively or unproductively? What are mm -hmm. the long-term effects of where they're directing the money? Which countries and which governments do that well? Which ones do it poorly? It's a whole different set of risks today. There's still risks, but the nature of the risk is changing. And, and so therefore the way you think about structuring a portfolio needs to be, uh, needs to be evolving to, to recognize that. Although I think, you know, from what you described about where is the money going, if you don't have really unique insights and don't have the system to track where their money is going, it's, it, it's difficult to really get ahead of the game and if you have those insights then then you know the, the ability to produce outsized returns would probably be a, you you would have a higher probability of doing that i think it's a better world for alpha now uh okay. because of what you're describing the differentiation and the understanding of understanding where the money goes um is uh you know is something that not many people have. Everybody sort of uh, got, got the gist that when they cut interest rates, housing goes up in autos, <laughs> and, and then when capacity utilization goes above 82%, they tighten. I mean, that whole, that whole world got very well discounted. Um, and, uh, but we're now in a world where uh, you have to literally be able to track the money through the pipes in the system and uh, in order to anticipate that. So yes, from an alpha standpoint, I think it's probably more challenging, but more potential opportunity. Uh, but also uh, from a beta standpoint, uh, thinking about if you want to just neutralize yourself, thinking differently about how you neutralize yourself, uh, recognizing, uh, breaking down the components separately, the cash flows on the assets, the currency of the asset, super important, because the printing of money or the not printing of money or the wisdom of how the money is used is going to have a big impact on the currency. Uh, so the cash flows, the currency, and then the discount rate on those cash flows, risk premium, real yields, and how that's changing and the level of it, high or low. Those are your key variables for structuring a portfolio and then to recognize differences across countries. Because when you go through those variables and you compare country A, B, C, and D, much more different than 20 years ago. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, much more everybody sort of operated the same way. Now, much more like everybody is playing their own playbook 
in, in different ways because it's now very political. It's not just a, a central banker there, you know, pulling the lever the way, um, you know, uh, Paul Volcker or Alan Greenspan used to do it. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, the world keeps evolving, right? Just one, just one final note before we uh, close. Uh, so uh, allocating the, the split between maintaining an allocation to the market, the beta, although now the beta is, it, it has to deal with the new environment, and then uh, the, other, the other part of the risk part to the alpha, which we, we just went through. Would you say it is advisable to, to, to maintain that sort of 50-50 if, if from the context of, you know, you never know uh, uh, how the beta, uh, how the alpha might sort of behave, but by the same token, the, the beta has a more reliable uh, uh, sort of mirror reversion. Um, yeah, I think there are two ways to answer that question. So um, the choice between beta and alpha is first of all, based on a recognition of what you're good at. The better you are at alpha, the more you should have an alpha mm -hmm. because alpha is always adaptable to whatever environment you're in. So that's the first question. <clears throat> and, you, and you might be good at, at doing alpha yourself or finding an alpha manager. Th those are equally good paths, right? So the better you are at alpha, the more alpha you want because of the adaptability to make money in any environment. Um, beta is always going to be a safer route. It's the more sure outcome, but the upside potential is less. And particularly in today's world where uh, assets are made increasingly unattractive by their yields going lower and lower and lower. So just holding assets is uh, less, less rewarding uh, from a return standpoint today than it, than it has been maybe ever. Um, and so, uh, and, and so uh, a balance between them, like if you're not quite sure on the alpha, you're not quite sure on the beta, but you, it is a 50-50 makes a lot of sense because, because you don't wanna put all the eggs in one basket or the other. And to, each one sort of hedges the other in a certain way. If I put it all in beta, I might be wrong about my beta, right? And, and I'd like to have the potential for some tactical moves to protect me but if I put it all in alpha, then I might've been wrong about my ability to actually uh, do that well. So, I, uh, so if you're a 50-50, I think is a good starting point. And then I think you could move one way or the other as a function of, of, um, of what I'm describing. And also probably, you know, let's say I, I would speak in our case, we have chosen, you know, uh, 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 the all weather for, for the beta and the all weather action is, has adapted to this new environment. Very well. Yeah. Well, it's it the, the all the all weather portfolio is designed to adapt to any kind of environment. Uh, yes. So it's uh, you know I think if I was hearing your question generically, right, as beta mm -hmm. and alpha, but I, I think that uh, if you have a well designed beta, like I think all weathers, it, it, it's the best we can do. A good quality balance between economic environments and also different parts of the world. Um, and so it's, it's going to be the most adaptable beta that you can get, but the alpha itself will incrementally be a source of risk reduction in, in bad markets because you can go short, uh, but also uh, can ramp up your exposure to assets in good periods and then add, add alpha that's just uncorrelated to that beta. So that, that will, that's bound to be, um, you know, a better portfolio. Bob? Thank you for your time. It's always a pleasure, you know, sort of catching up. And in today's world, these virtual meetings are very sort of good. We, you know, we can do that without suffering jet lag. <laughs> although, although in person is, is, is also equally good. I would probably say, you know, at some stage, you have to donate some of your timing to be a professor. Because you are, you explain very well. And what you know, I think, you know, it's good to, to, to share it to the new generation who are going to go and manage people's savings. Well, uh, thank you, Hashim. Yeah, it's great to see you just on a, on a moment's notice, just push the button, right? And we can, <laughs> we can say hello and have a good conversation. But you've always been, among all of our clients for 30 years, you've always been among the most probing, um, 
truth seeking, analytically rigor clients that we've had. Uh, and we've always learned from these kind of conversations. So, uh, you know, thank you for that whole multiple decades, but, and, and uh, as we go forward in, in conversations like this, I hope that your clients uh, appreciate the extent to which you're bringing that to them. It's, it's really very rare. Uh, I hope so too. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you, Ashim. See ya. Thank you.